Thank you. So hi again. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for staying here. Um, so I, I'm going to talk about something completely different in this talk, which has nothing to do with the previous talk. So uh, unfortunately, I cannot recycle any slides. And um, so I'm going to talk about a new concept. This is a completely new concept, which is called multi-instance uh, security. And I'll try to explain what is this and its connection to password-based cryptography. And uh, uh, in particular, I want to start motivating this work uh, by talking about the problem of uh, file encryption. So the goal is that we want to store some data privately on a hard drive by using symmetric encryption. And of course, one problem we have to face here, which might be problematic every now and then, is that if we do that, we also need to remember somehow to store our keys in order to be the key that we use to encrypt, in order to be able to retrieve the data at a later point in time. Okay, this might not always be feasible. So an alternative solution which has been proposed is to leverage on the fact that uh, passwords are supposed to be easy to remember and derive cryptographic keys from passwords. And in particular, this is the whole idea behind uh, password-based encryption, which is used within a multitude of different products around. And in password-based encryption, we derive cryptographic keys from user passwords by using a special uh, cryptographic function which is called a key derivation function or KDF for short. And the idea is that we have given a password, we are going to derive such a key and then use this key within a conventional symmetric encryption scheme to encrypt messages. Of course, as long as you remember the password, you're also going to be able to uh, recover your data. But the problem is that um, choosing good passwords is a very, very hard task. So we need to choose passwords that on the one hand are hard to guess by an adversary, but on the other hand, we want them to be easy to remember. Okay? So there's like a kind of attention, and even if you look at the media, you will find many, many uh, articles telling you all of the sort of things that can happen because of one of these two problems. Okay? And so, but people are inherently lazy, so people are always going to choose, in fact, passwords that are very easy to remember and that are not that good. And this leads to a common problem, which is what is known as dictionary attack. So it is, uh, so an attacker can break a password-based system uh, by exploiting the fact that most of the passwords chosen by users are within a fairly small, uh, a sufficiently small dictionary of uh, very likely common passwords. Okay. And one technique used by system designers to mitigate such dictionary attacks uh, is to make KDF computations uh, like sufficiently expensive so that such a dictionary attack is going to be slowed down. So for example, one common technique uh, to derive a key derivation function is to just iterate a cryptographic hash function, such as a function from the SHA family, uh, a certain number of times, C times, okay? And uh, if we use this within a uh, password-based encryption system uh, to derive our key, then the expectation that we have is that if we need to apply a certain amount of work, say N, to retrieve a password, for example, through a dictionary attack, and N will be the dictionary size, then we would expect that because of the complexity of computing the KDF, it will take work, time, uh, work equal to C times N, roughly, to break the password-based encryption scheme using this KDF. But here we have to make an important point. Note that even if we assume that we choose passwords really, really well, so N is something like two to the 32, which would be fantastic, I think, and uh, we also let uh, the KDF computation be very slow, uh, slow, so we let C be something like two to the 20, then at the end of the day, we're not, get, not, we're not going to get anything better than 52 bits of security, okay? which is not really great. So it seems that we have an unavoidable fact, if you use password-based encryption, that it is very well possible that an attacker can break one particular instance of a, of a password-based encryption scheme. So is this the end? So the point that we want to make, and this is not, that there are other things that we would like to expect from a good uh, k-derivation function and a password-based encryption scheme. In particular, we want to look at the multi-user setting where there are many users, each one using uh, their own passwords to encrypt files. And what we've just seen, it's only the fact that if you have an attacker, and the attacker wants to retrieve, a uh, say, some message that has been encrypted by user one from a corresponding ciphertext C1, then you can do that in work C times N, and we might not be happy because C times N is just too small. But what we want to ask here is the question, what happens now if the adversary wants to retrieve a message from a second ciphertext belonging to another user? How much work does the adversary need to do? Uh, much additional work. And the expectation here is that ideally, we would like the amount of work to increase linearly in the number of ciphertexts. So we would like the work to be m times c times n to retrieve n plain text. 
But note that this is not easy to ensure. I mean, for example, if we use the KDF function I just defined a couple of slides ago, then we can really have an easy uh, dictionary attack where we just go do a lot of pre-computation and go through all possible passwords, derive all corresponding keys. This is going to take work n times c. And then whenever we have a ciphertext that we want to decrypt, we just try all possible keys. And this will give us, to retrieve n message, will give us work n times c plus m, which is much smaller than what we want. And so a new design goal that we would like to, uh, to, to, to hold for our KDFs is what we call multi-instance security amplification. We would like to design KDFs with the property that the amount of work to break uh, multiple instances increases linearly in the number of instances. Okay, now interestingly, so if you look at the actual proposals in standards, in particular in PKCS5, uh, to how to uh, design KDFs, you're going to see that they all use a technique which is uh, known as salting, which indeed happens to prevent the attack I just mentioned. So in particular, the most common key derivation function is called KDF1 here. It's going to use iteration as before, but before iterating the password, it's going to first compute a, a fresh random value for each KDF computation, which we call the salt, and then append it to the password and then apply the iteration. And in particular, if you use this within password-based encryption, what is going to happen is that upon each encryption, we are going to choose a for fresh salt, compute the KDF with that salt, and then we need to append the salt to the ciphertext in order to allow for decryption afterwards. So in particular, each encryption is going to be with a different salt and pre-computation as in the previous attack does not work anymore. So is this by chance? Is just salting just preventing this particular attack? Or can we actually prove that salting uh, probably ensures multi-instance uh, security amplification, which would be our goal? And before I, I, go to, I turn to this question, let me just point out that this is far from being a purely academic theoretical question. You might have heard that a few months ago there's been an attack against LinkedIn where millions of passwords have been leaked of different users. And it turns out that the reason this was actually possible to break so many passwords from multiple users was that neither iteration nor salting were actually used by LinkedIn. And this made the job very, very easy. So it is a very important question to analyze the effect of salting and iteration with respect to amplification. So the question is, what do we know? Well, it turns out that we do not really know anything of whether salting provides, in a provable way, uh, multi instance security amplification. And the reason is not only, as you would expect, that nobody has proved that, but the main point is there's also no formal model to address multi instance security of cryptographic schemes. Okay, and this leads us exactly to our two contributions. Um, so the first main contribution is of, of our work is to define a general definitional framework to deal with multi-instance security uh, of uh, arbitrary cryptographic primitives. And the second contribution is just as a case study of our framework to study uh, multi-instance security amplification for um, password-based encryption. Okay. And now I guess I will spend most of the time in the remainder of this talk talking about how we uh, uh, model multi-instance security. Okay. And to do this, let me first review how we can model security of password-based encryption in the single instance set. Okay. So the basic way to do that is just to adapt the notion of semantic security, of left or right semantic security, uh, to the uh, password-based setting. So we consider a game involving an adversary and a challenger, and where the challenger chooses first the random bit, B, and samples a password, and then the adversary can make queries consisting of pairs of messages M0 and M1 of equal length, and obtains an encryption of MB under the given password. And then at the end, the adversary outputs a bit B prime, and wins the game if B prime is equal B. And we have a corresponding advantage measure that tells us how well the adversary performs, which essentially looks at the probability that the bit B prime equals B, and then we subtract one half to take into account the fact that you can always guess the bit B with probability one half trivially by just outputting a random guess, and then we multiply everything by two to make this a number between zero and one. That's the usual way. Um, we can also look at other property, like uh, puzzle recoverability security, where the adversary just interacts with the encryption scheme under a secret password and wants to guess uh, which password is actually used. And uh, the Advantage is just the probability that the adversary guesses the right password. Okay, and now we would like to extend this type of security notions to the, uh, the multi-instance world. Okay, 
So our goal is for a certain scheme S and for a certain security property P, like an encryption scheme and left or right semantic security, is to define a security metric that captures uh, the success of an adversary in doing the following. So the adversary is going to attack M instances of uh, the scheme in concurrently, in parallel, and uh, we might even allow the adversary to corrupt some of the instances. For example, corruption will mean in the password-based setting to learn the corresponding password. And also, the adversary is going to win uh, the game if it breaks all of the uncorrupted instances. Okay. So this is quite easy to do if we look at a security property like password recover uh, recoverability security. Um, here we can just uh, do this very natural. So instead of, instead of having one challenger, we are going to have multiple challengers, each one sampling a password independently. And then the adversary can concurrently interact with these challengers and uh, uh, obtain encryptions for the corresponding passwords of arbitrary messages in a concurrent fashion. And uh, um, corruptions are just modeled by having special corruption queries to uh, the individual challengers that are going to reveal the passwords. And at the end, the adversary is going to output a vector of passwords and is going to win if all of the passwords have been guessed correctly. Okay, and the advantage is just this probability. So this is not so surprising, but what is surprising is that for other types of security properties like left or right semantic security, where the adversary's task is to guess a bit, things get a bit quick, uh, trickier. So in particular, uh, here, it's quite easy to define the experiment initially. So we, again, we have independent challengers. The adversary can interact in a concurrent fashion. But the real question is what happens at the end? What does the adversary output? And what is the advantage that measures the success of the adversary? So because the naive attempt will do what we've done before. So this is what we call the end advantage. So we just let the adversary output a vector of bits. And uh, corresponding to the, each instance, we have m instances. And the adversary wins if all of these bits are correct. And the advantage is just the probability. The problem is that this quantity does not measure the harness of winning all uncorrupted instances. And this is, this is quite subtle to see. But the point is the following. Assume we have two instances, and we have an adversary that is pretty good at guessing the first bit corresponding to the first instance. It does so with probability three quarters. Uh, or larger than three quarters, then it's very easy to obtain an adversary that doesn't even look at the second distance. He doesn't, might even not make queries to the other challenger, and just guesses the second bit uniformly at random. Then this adversary is still going to get advantage at least three eight, three over eight, which is above the trivial uh, random guess, but he doesn't even try to attack the second instance. And so this is not what we want. And so a better alternative is to look at what we call the extra advantage, which actually seems to be the right alternative, uh, is that here we just let the adversary output one bit, one single bit, not a vector of bits, B prime, and the adversary wins if this bit equals the XOR of all of the bits chosen by the challengers, okay? B1 up to Bm. And of course we scale by one half as before. And uh, this is going to be what we call the extra advantage, and here you see what I've said before doesn't work anymore. So even if you have an adversary which is really good at guessing the first bit, and now he tries to randomly guess the second bit, or he doesn't even interact with the other challenger, then the adversary can only guess the extra with probability one half, and he doesn't get any advantage. So we looked at relationship between uh, security notions, and for example, there's a, you can have like an interesting picture. So for example, if you look at uh, um, so left or right security, both in the extra and in the end case, they end up implying the multi-instance version of password recoverability security. But what is interesting is that, in fact, uh, the extra advantage version of left or right security does imply, in most cases, to a very beautiful probabilistic lemma by Falk Hunger, uh, the, uh, the, the end version of uh, left or right security, um, which shows exactly that extra is the right way to go. In fact, there is also some sort of weak implication in the other direction that I won't discuss through the goldreich levin theorem, but this is very... Uh, is very weak in a computational sense and doesn't give us anything useful uh, when we want to work with practical parameters. Okay, and I just want to quickly point out that there's our other uh, interesting um, uh, phenomena if we want to look at relations between security properties in the multi-instance scenario that shows that there are many interesting technical questions. So for example, if you look at an alternative way of defining semantic security, which is real or random security here below, where the adversary only inputs a message M0, 
this X query consists of a message M0, and, uh, and then of depending on the choice of the bit B by the challenger, either obtains an encryption of M0 or obtains an encryption of a random message. Okay, this is another way of defining security of encryption, and we all know that this is a classical textbook uh, theorem, at least not for the case, case of traditional encryption, that these two notions are essentially equivalent because their advantages are within a factor two of each other. Okay, and the reason they are within a factor two of each other is because the proof goes via what is known as a hybrid argument, where we upper bound uh, the left or right advantage in terms of twice uh, the, real of, uh, the real of random advantage. Okay, this is a traditional uh, crypto 101 uh, exercise. But what, what, what can we do if we now move to the multi-instance setting? Can we do something similar and relate the multi-instance versions of real of random and left or right security? And it turns out that here, things are much trickier. We can do that, but it's not trivial to extend the hybrid argument at all. In fact, it's quite involved. And in particular, the factor two that we have in the single instance setting is going to become two to the n and is going to be increasing exponentially. And this is because we have to consider way more hybrids and one would think we can cheat and optimize this, but it turns out that this, this bound is actually tight and we can't do any better. It's, it's fine because in most cases this factor two to the n, which looks huge, won't be that huge because the advantages involved will be very small, but this shows how things are actually subtle when we move to the multi-instance uh, scenario. Okay, so let me just spend very few words about what's happening with uh, password-based encryption. Um, so we do indeed as an application in the paper now confirm uh, the expectation that uh, using salting ensures uh, multi-instance security amplification. And the key point of our analysis is to prove uh, security of uh, the KDF function from the PKS PKCS5 in the random oracle model. And in particular, uh, I won't say anything about this, just a very high level. The, the crucial point is that we introduce a notion, a security notion for KDS, which is a variant of the indifferentiability notion by Maurer, Render, and Holenstein, which has some interesting feature in particular that it is restricted in the sense that uh, simulators um, are only allowed to make a much smaller number of queries than the queries that they actually have to answer. But given this, at the end, everything is fine. We're gonna get a final theorem that is going to give us a concrete security bound in the random oracle model for password-based encryption. And in particular, uh, if we look, you don't have to look at the bound in detail, but it means that as long as the uh, underlying encryption scheme is semantically secure, then the leading term in this bound is going to be this one, which is going to tell us that we really need to invest work m times c times n to break the underlying password-based encryption, where real work, here work is measured in terms of random oracle queries. Okay, so this was all I wanted to say. Uh, in summary, so what we've seen here is that our main observation is that, so there are multiple users that are using encryption, password-based encryption of any other cryptographic schemes in the world, and that there are settings like password-based encryption where weak individual instances of cryptographic schemes are inherently unavoidable. So you can't avoid that one single instance can be broken. But multi-instance security still provides an interesting second line of defense where we're gonna say, okay, that's something we cannot avoid, but at least we want our scheme to ensure that breaking many instances of this scheme is hard. And uh, this leads to some, some very interesting technical questions, as we've seen, and uh, uh, one of them is exactly, was analyzing a concrete uh, password-based, concretely password-based encryption in this setting, but there are certainly other applications that can be found and other interesting technical questions to be answered. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat>